test. Uh, are you able to see? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Martin Weinstein. Yeah, Martin. I need to. <laughs> we need to update these videos. Um, great. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'll go ahead and kick off. Um, yeah, thank you everybody who's attending. Um, yeah, so uh, for those who this is the first call, I want to uh, quickly note that, uh, that we follow the uh, Hyperledger antitrust policy um, and also the Hyperledger code of conduct. Um, so if this is your first call, please review those. Um, usually it's customary when I open up these calls to, to see if there are any participants that are here for the first time, uh, to please, uh, raise your hand uh, and introduce yourself. I'd love to hear a little bit about how you found out about us and, um, where you, uh, where, 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 where your subject matter expertise is, what your interest is. Is there anybody uh, on the call for the first time? Sounds like no. Okay. All right, um, so I'll run through just a couple quick announcements. Um, we have actually um, been invited, um, Bert, uh, Bertrand Roux and I have been in invited to participate in the um, uh, IWA um, uh, Interwork Alliance uh, working group that's focused on um, developing um, a carbon emissions token, standards for carbon emissions tokenization. Uh, so that's that's pretty exciting, um, and um, will it's definitely relevant to the work that we're doing. We're also in the process of, for those of you who were on the presentation two weeks ago from Guardian uh, and the HR Foundation, we're we're looking into exploring um, how to integrate uh, the Guardian into the climate uh, accounting solution that we've developed for, for tracking emissions across scope three. Um, and uh, we'll be having a conversation this week about that. So that's that's a potentially um, really uh, useful tool that could uh, help us kind of move forward with, uh, with some of the development work that we've done. Um, are there any other announcements before I uh, introduce Alexi and, and, and hand it over? Did you, did you put links to those things in the chat? Uh, I did not. The, the, the links to the, the I, I, work in, along. in work alliance. Um, yeah, I'll happy to, I'm happy to do that. I got, when mm -hmm. I look uh, when I uh, after I introduce them. Great. Okay. Um, well, uh, with I'm really excited to have Alexi Shudrin here today. Uh, he is the co-founder and CEO of, of EverCity.io. I uh, have had the opportunity to see one of his presentations before. Um, he's uh, it's, a, it's a critical piece of infrastructure, and, and I think um, just a, a really interesting application uh, around Web3 and, and open source for, for green finance uh, democratization. Um, and with that, Alexi, I'll just, I'll just hand over the floor to you um, and uh, allow you to share your screen. One moment. Yeah, Stop sure. Sharing. Thanks a lot, Sherwood. Um, you see, for, for this conversation, I would uh, prefer maybe to have like a more lively discussion and stuff uh, okay. rather okay. than to show slides and, and, and stuff. Because, you know, I think it's very important uh, for us uh, to understand where this whole uh, you know refi space is coming from what is important what we should consider while building you know the applications and and stuff um so um how many of you guys are like builders uh people who are like actually building the stuff maybe how can we you know understand that maybe you can raise hands or you know give me a some kind of another sign because I really want to better understand the, the audience and uh, how to frame uh, the discussion today. Yeah, maybe raise hands. Yeah. Okay, we have one builder. <laughs> uh, great. Kim Lush. Okay. Kim Lush is a builder too. Okay, so we have two builders. That's that's amazing. Nice. Uh, Three builders. Elizabeth. Elizabeth uh, is also building something. 
Amazing. Uh, Amazing. Floor builders. Okay. <laughs> the hands are coming. <laughs> nice. Okay. Then thanks for raising your hands, guys. Nice meeting you. So uh, then who has some kind of uh, sustainability background? Um, can you also share and uh, raise your hands then? Anyone who was involved in sustainability before? Okay. Uh, even, sustainability, even sustainability projects, is it tech-wise or is it domain sustainability? Um, it, it could be both, you know, but uh, mainly domain sustainability and stuff like that. So I want to understand who is coming from this direction here. I thought you meant environmental sustainability. Okay, that's amazing. So we have one really uh, cool expert who has both... Uh, uh you know backgrounds and that's pretty rare so congrats on that elizabeth and uh what have you been doing before in sustainability elizabeth i think that question was for you oh you're, you're on mute elizabeth oh building so i'm building um an uh, environment let's see lifetime comprehensive environmental impact calculator that connects to a, a carbon mar token market and carbon uh, i have a, a whole carbon standard carbon token standard that i sent out to vera and icbcm back uh, september october of last year so i'm trying to build nice this, uh, uh, I mean, yeah what transferring your, uh, energies uh, Thanks, Elizabeth. But uh, my, my question was uh, referring to your pre previous sustainability background. So can you share a little bit? Oh, that's environmentally that? sustainability. So I'm a certified forest steward. I um, developed a forest. I actually uh, re d developed a plan to restore uh, acreage of nat native forest um, for about and, and was on actually on the land doing uh, Native forest studies and restoration for about ten years. Okay, that's that's amazing, amazing background and a very interesting story. I'm quite curious, you know, what uh, you know how how you came across uh, blockchain. But let me then first uh, tell you my story, so you can better understand uh, who I am and where I'm coming from, and uh, then we can discuss uh, more on the topic of of today's uh, meeting. So um, I started my career in uh, actually commodities trading in uh, Genoa in Switzerland. And uh, that was very interesting because it showed how goods are moving, you know, how a financial system works, but uh, never brought any impact. <laughs> and on the contrary, right? I couldn't really understand uh, why we need to trade all those oil commodities and uh, sometimes really trading like thin air and making money, which didn't bring like any impact and didn't make any sense to me. But, uh, and that was like 15 years ago. But uh, thanks to that company, I came across uh, CO2 uh, trading and European CO2 trading market. And uh, it was a very interesting presentation about hedging strategies on European CO2 trading market, which was a hundred page uh, uh, presentation made by one of the traders. And uh, that really opened up like a very interesting market for me. And uh, I realized that uh, it's something more than just, you know, some derivatives and some tra trading. So um, I came across uh, climate change then as a big threat to humanity. And it really amazed me um, how important it is and how, you know, how actually not enough our actions uh, are and were at this point. So um, I quit this company and started my own organization, uh, which was a carbon fund. And uh, this carbon fund developed climate projects, nature-based, but also looked at uh, technology-based uh, solutions and projects. And so we started working with uh, big multinational corporations like Alcoa, Unilever, and uh, PepsiCo, and Bloomberg, and many others, uh, helping them to actually understand their uh, sustainability risks, their emission reductions potential, 
And uh, maybe you know that saying that uh, reduce what you can and offset what you can't. So that's what we were <laughs> helping them with uh, back then. It was more than 12 years ago already. So it was uh, pretty, uh, you know, pretty early also for carbon markets. And uh, clients had all sorts of motivations to buy carbon offsets, not only kind of, you know, what we see now, but uh, a lot of marketing, a lot of GR, a lot of other things that actually drive uh, the demand uh, back then. And then um, we started to get global. We started to participate in the UN climate uh, conference format in some of the other UN associations and uh, initiatives like UN Global Compact. It's an organization uh, which unites a lot of businesses on the agenda of sustainable development and, by the way, uh, science-based targets and uh, this kind of thing. So actually UN Global Compact is one of the global organizations that actually promoted uh, you know, uh, science-based targets and uh, carbon offsetting and stuff like that. And also some of the others organizations. So uh, we went to this global level. Uh, we were full of enthusiasm and we thought everyone really wants to save the world. But uh, we realized maybe it's not the case for everyone. So as I mentioned, there were all sorts of other motivations uh, of buyers of carbon credits and stuff like that. And also there were, and still there are many inefficiencies, which I will cover uh, in a few minutes. So after that, oh, after Paris Climate Conference, which was like the really historical one because the Paris Agreement was adopted. And uh, you may know, right, what the Paris Agreement is. It limits the global warming or at least tries to. And... Uh, provides new mechanisms uh, for uh, carbon financing. And uh, this was largely based on the Kyoto Protocol, as you know. And Kyoto Protocol is largely based on previous initiatives like uh, the US initiative for, uh, you know, those controlling the, the sulfur uh, emissions and uh, trying to actually uh, solve the acid rain problem. And that really worked out. So now Paris Agreement is another iteration of uh, those systems, of those markets. And so the voluntary carbon market actually, uh, um, I would say, was a spin-off or is a spin-off of Kyoto Protocol because uh, everything that we're using right now in the voluntary carbon market, those methodologies that we're now trying to digitize uh, all of the processes and stuff, they all actually come from basic Kyoto protocol uh, mechanisms and ideas. So uh, I just recently was in Denver at a uh, carbon, like, sorry, a climate uh, forum for refi startups. And some of the startups approached me asking to validate their uh, digital methodologies and stuff, their ideas. So what I recommended them to do is to look at uh, CDM, which is uh, Clean Development Mechanism under Kyoto Protocol, which actually rolls out all of the key parts that should be uh, included in any methodologies, wh whether it's a digitized one or it's a, you know an analog one. But it's one of the key sources of this knowledge that is used widely on the voluntary market by Vera, by Gold Standard, by many, many others. So um, if you're trying to build something and you're new to uh, you know, climate finance and stuff, so uh, my first message to you today would be um, to stand on the shoulders of giants rather than trying to create everything from scratch. So, uh, you know, there were a lot of smart people who dedicated their lives to this industry, to this knowledge. And it all started, of course, not in the 90s where, when Kyoto Protocol was actually introduced, but it actually started uh, earlier, you know, in the 70s, I guess. And it all comes, it's connected with the Austrian Economic School and uh, Ronald Coase and uh, the concept of including transactional costs into the pricing of goods and services. So that was one of these basic ideas that actually is 
you know, developing more and more. And we're now seeing not only carbon, but biodiversity uh, attempts to include biodiversity into economic relations of uh, economic agents. So uh, just look into that, look at what have been developed uh, by previous uh, generations and people who really, you know, dedicated their lives to that and try to innovate based on that and not to create something really, really new, unattached from the reality. Because, you know, even the, those uh, artists like uh, Malevich, for example, who actually introduced this uh, black square, he actually learned how to paint uh, and he was, uh, you know, well-educated in painting. So he could paint you everything, literally. And then he painted the the black square so it's kind of the case for for refi and if we want to build something meaningful and something that people will use as an open source around the globe then it should be aligned with core values principles and processes that were developed uh, back then so uh, that's it's a very important thing but uh to go back to my story uh, we started after Paris Climate Conference, we started to look at uh, innovations and uh, invested in some of the companies. Uh, some of it was hardware, some of it was software. And uh, one of the companies actually made a breakthrough. Uh, the company was called DAO IPCI and uh, uh, IPCI stands for uh, Integrated Platform for Climate Initiatives. And uh, the team behind that and the concept behind that was really visionary because the, this DAO was established actually in 2016. And uh, it actually facilitated the world's first carbon credit transaction in 2017, in I think March 2017. So that was officially acknowledged by the World Bank uh, people, by uh, the UN, uh, the company and myself. Uh, we were invited to several events around the globe. So one of them was actually Innovate for Climate in Barcelona, which was the leading carbon innovation uh, conference and still is. But because of COVID, uh, they, they've uh, hosted two conferences online. So I guess it was not that, you know, viral, but uh, actually... That, that was the main innovation carbon conference. And we met with all of the market players. We met with uh, uh, heads of standards, uh, David Antonioli from Vera. We met with gold standard people. We met with all the exchanges and project developers. So uh, the discussion started actually in 2017. And if someone is saying that Refi was born like, you know, one or two years ago, it might be true in terms of the massive movement, but uh, the first refi project started to pop up even earlier. So 2016, even 15. And uh, that was a major breakthrough, but that was another learning that uh, no one really was waiting for us. Uh, and uh, the market was pretty oligopolistic by its nature. So the main players, and they're still there, controlled the largest shares of the market. And, uh, you know, if you learned economic theory that you know that oligopoly and monopoly is, is, are not the most effective systems of uh, distribution of resources. So that's the same case for carbon and other markets. And uh, people back then were really afraid of blockchain. Uh, they were afraid of ICO wave. They were afraid of new technologies. And of course, they were afraid of being phased out, out of the market. And the message that we brought to them, you know, we had the wrong messaging because we came there. We were surrounded by all of these people. And we said, now, guys, blockchain is going to disrupt you all and we will not need you. So sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't need auditors. We have digital MRV. We don't need project developers. We have digital methodologies. We don't need, you know, literally anyone, just a project owner, owner of the land and the end user. So all of you guys, we don't need you. And that was a very bad messaging, you know, and it turned out to be uh, actually a, a mistake. So that's another learning that I want to communicate, uh, you know, from my experience 
uh, that even now we don't have to um, you know phase out everyone and disrupt and just exclude everyone because uh, if you start building refi projects and you start you will start having your first clients or partners you know somewhere in africa or you know in other parts of the world you will understand how important it is to have the domain expertise the industry expertise the methodology wise expertise to be on the ground you know to talk to these people and etc cetera, etc cetera. it doesn't really work in a fully automated manner and no one has really proved the the opposite you know right now everything that we learn right now from talking to more projects and stuff successful players either they had the expertise before or they were not afraid to have partners to get their feet on the ground you know and talk to uh, to everyone with whom they're trying to make business it's like in any other industry so you know refi or you know climate finance is not any different from any other industry so you either have to come from the industry or you need to have uh you know your experts ready there and uh be based on the principles that were developed before in a way but in a way disrupt uh, but not saying that we don't need everyone because uh you know from what we see now we still need all of the players uh that are currently there but we can make their life easier and uh open source is something that can really play uh a big role here a huge role so i want to make a short pause here and maybe you have some other opinions and statements uh or questions regarding like uh my my experience and stuff um uh, yeah yeah, I've got I've got a question. Um, you talked about the messaging that didn't work. I, I'm curious to hear, um, and you spoke to it that to, to make their life easier. But what really helped move the needle um, to uh, to kind of achieve buy-in, achieve proof of concept, achieve adopt you know early adoption um, amongst these you know vested uh, you know stakeholders that had just been around. Well, you know, Sherwood, that's a very interesting question. And I think in 2017, uh, we just uh, faced this problem that many venture investors are aware of. When you're introducing some innovation earlier than it it could be adopted by the market, you know. Uh, so I think the positioning was wrong. I think people were afraid of blockchain because the ICO thing was really you know very viral and loud and stuff and uh also you know the market was not really moving because carbon markets guys i i'm not sure how how long are you following them but uh for more than 10 years the market was really stable and uh it was like you know 300 million and 500 million and 400 million and six so it it was growing or not growing it was like really flat and uh it somehow climbed up to a billion and then like uh we had this twofold growth in 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 the recent years so i guess this is one of the factors but uh you know in 2017 i met a guy there in the, at the innovate for climate the core carbon person related to innovations and what he said to me is like this thing will come in five years uh because of the reasons i mentioned also regulation you know and the maturity of technology as well because back then technology was not that user friendly if you remember you know metamask didn't have uh the app and the overall interface was really kind of not that good as now you know and, and that was the case with everything everything you know every parts of the blockchain infrastructure it was like you know people are still talking about interfaces and user experience even now right but back then five years ago it was very basic very you know um uh, very generic so people really need this experience and i think this is one of the feedback that i also got because just sharing my experience uh, we had a demo in 2017 for a very big player in the carbon market and we totally failed 
uh, because of the interfaces. And uh, they just didn't understand the thing, you know, okay, we're you know, doing, taking hash, making a copy, you know, sending it somewhere, some fields, some. So our developers, they thought it's you know, genius. It's like a breakthrough and it was. But in terms of user experience, it was nothing. And uh, people just didn't understand what is that, what, you know, how to use it, why, why is it needed to be introduced, you know? So uh, that's another learning that I had, you know, that uh, user experience, user interface is key. And I just returned from Japan where the customer is not only right, he is God. Mm -hmm. So I think this is what we need to adopt in the blockchain industry, that the customer is God. And mm -hmm. uh, we really need to make things really simple, really uh native you know for more people to use it and more companies to use it so also that was a major fail that uh um you know taught me a lot and now in every city you are making a very big accent on uh user interfaces as well and also for open source you know because uh open source usually it's something on the github and it's great if it has documentation but usually you know even documentation is not that good or is done for developers and uh, it doesn't really help others to, to use the open source code. So uh, on that side, we also need to improve, you know, and have well-documented stuff. And ideally something that uh, Guardian is doing, you know, why I like what they're doing is that they're trying to implement a low code or no code approach to that. And that's what uh, the DAO IPCI project uh, had actually introduced one of these ideas that we had in this DAO IPCI project is that, you know, all of the, you know, everyone should can should have an opportunity to easily launch and instantly launch uh, their environmental programs and apps on this DAO. And that was the, the basic concept that we had. And from the very beginning, this the concept, the, the company was open source, so everything was open source and we really had hard times with uh, some shareholders that were lawyers to explain them that guys were not registering IP, we're doing everything open source. And <laughs> that's how things sometimes work. And we, you know, show the example of Red Hat and stuff like that. Uh, but no one really could understand that. But now the understanding is there. So uh, mm. there are more and more open source projects and uh, that's what we really need uh, while doing our open source. We have to think about the user who is God, not only friend or, you know, uh, contributor or someone else. He is actually God because he will need to use it. And that's that's a very important thing if we want to build open source. So if you have any you have any other quick questions and I'll jump to the to the next part of the story and uh, some next uh, outcomes that I want to highlight from my journey in this okay so I assume there are no no more questions uh, so then I can tell you the last part of my story um, so you know we realized that uh, Blockchain and open source is really an enabler for climate finance based on this experience uh, that we had with the first transaction. And uh, we started to, to participate in the UN protests every year. So we went to the UN climate conference. I missed only one in Morocco, and then I visited all of them. And uh, that was really a mind-opening experience because uh, when we started building open source in this company, I thought, okay, open source, but I didn't really realize why are we doing this open source and who might need it, you know, except for developers, maybe they can do a fork, do something else, blah, blah, blah. So it was very abstract to me because I'm not a developer. And uh, when I started to present these things at, at the climate conference, and uh, first we started like with a booth about blockchain and stuff like that, <laughs> come to us we have blockchain and cookies and and stuff yeah, yeah but uh, you know i'm giving out swag and that was pretty weird because at the climate conference there was no other you know blockchain company back then 
in 2017 and people were really interested so we started to make workshops we started to make like um, you know press conferences and stuff with some other friends from the climate chain coalition and this is an organization we established in 2017 which kind of unites more than 400 members from 60 countries around the globe and uh tries to somehow you know promote blockchain for climate and uh i think uh, we've succeeded and it was officially supported by the UN, but right now the UN person, Masamba, he kind of uh, resigned from the climate change coalition because they started something bigger in the UN, which is the uh, UN Global Digital Innovation Hub. And I encourage you guys uh, all to collaborate with uh, both the CCC, the climate change coalition, and if you're lucky, also try to collaborate with uh, uh the un global digital innovation hub and i know that martin weinstein is one of the key people there so that's a very good uh entry point to this initiative uh, so we started to go to co-op we started to talk to people and we started to make a lot of presentations so uh a lot of people came to these presentations and then i realized why is it important to make open source because like once we had a really big room for 500 people. And it was like, not all crowded, but there were a lot of people. And uh, when we stopped, uh, you know, highlighting our use cases and stuff. So we went down to the, to the people and they actually surrounded us. I think it was 2018 or 2019. And these were people from various African countries from South America. And they all surrounded us. And we had like a two hour, you know, conversation, which uh, was really insightful for me. And what I learned is that people in these countries, they don't really want the ready solutions that you come, you know, from the global north and uh, supply them something that they need to pay for and just use and pay for high fees and stuff like that. That's what has been happening for a lot of time you know and that's what is still happening because if you come to cop you will see a lot of arguments between uh, people from global north and global south and uh what these people were desperately craving for is what it's a quote you know they said we need knowledge and we need technology we have smart people in in africa you know we have smart people in asia and in, in south america uh, we have developers, we have like, you know, energy, opportunity to, to actually build stuff. But what we lack is knowledge and technology. So this is what actually um, open source can deliver, you know, knowledge and technology. And then you will gain like, you know, thousands and thousands of followers, contributors, and stuff like that, if you treat them equally, and if you will be patient to, you know, kind of produce the knowledge and get, uh, and also, you know, supply the technology. So people here, they go first and you have to know whom are you building for and ideally, you know, meet these people. So I encourage you to, you know, go to these countries, go to the climate conference or some other formats where you can meet a lot of people from indigenous communities, from, you know, uh, various other industries, project developers, landowners, and talk to them and try to understand their main um, desires there. And when you understand them, when you look into their eyes, you know, it will be clear for you what you need to do in terms of your, you know, open source uh, applications and how you need to treat them i can give you an example i know i have a friend a french guy he was uh, he lived in africa in central africa for many years you know and so he also went into their blockchain rabbit hole and stuff but uh what he started doing you know he started creating like his community with the people he knew there in central africa and uh you know engaging very actively with this community asking what they need and stuff like that and now even without blockchain he created like a huge discord community 
where people started to be like uh, very active uh, participants and they don't get any tokens they don't get any rewards but uh, they like the way he you know treats them as you know equal people and just sharing the knowledge and you know showing them the benefits and stuff and of course there are some rewards because there is a mechanism uh, related to data so they can go and uh, tr you know capture some data and then sell this data to the users to some kind of you know us or development finance institutions usaid and stuff like that so he actually created a decentralized uh, data marketplace without blockchain <laughs> Just, you know, with uh, the proper kind of attitude, uh, the proper kind of software that these people can use. And, and big part of it is, is an open source as well. So that's really important to know what the people want and need to talk to them and make this really accessible knowledge and technology. So there are lots of, you know, uh, companies that I know of from the core blockchain space, they organize a lot of schools, a lot of hackathons, and that's uh, an opportunity. That's what, uh, for example, African countries really, really need, you know, and not only learn how to code, but uh, learn how to collaborate and co-create together in a very user-friendly manner. So that's uh, exactly what is needed. And uh, ending on my story, so based on those many, many conversations with people from around the globe, uh, many insights, we started Ever City uh, two years ago in order to uh, solve the entry barrier problems, the knowledge barrier and uh, the cost barrier that prevent more companies to enter the green finance space, to start, uh, you know, raising using green bonds or start issuing carbon credits so education and making things really simple play a very big role in our company as well as the open source component and we have uh, a sustainable finance protocol that uh, we started to create on polkadot and now uh, we're continuing on hedera so adding hedera capabilities and so our idea is simple we want to create uh, a protocol that actually helps uh, to roll out um you know any apps um related to issuance of various green finance instruments so green bonds sustainability linked bonds and uh, also various carbon instruments we're adding those things to our protocol where we are collaborating with uh, the guys who want to use them so for example we have never worked on the green sukuk side you know, Sukuk is a, who knows what is green Sukuk, by the way, who can tell me? Sino uh, Islamic law. Right. So that's an Islamic uh, kind of law. Yeah. Uh, it has very specific Islamic rules in it, but it's an Islamic debt instrument, actually. So we never expected, but um, one of the, you know, um, people just uh, one guy just uh, contacted me and uh, regarding the protocol and started to build uh, a green sukuk based on what we have built uh, you know before and stuff like that so um yeah that's uh, pretty much uh, about me and i tried to tell the story with some of the outcomes that i got from you know my experience some failures some insights from talking to real people so i hope this can be useful for you uh, building your own open source uh, software technology so um, do you have any questions guys or things that you want to discuss i have a a, a quick question this is related to um, the sustainably sustainably linked loans and bonds or, or, or blended finance um, from some of the research that I've done, I've, I've seen that typically the deal sizes, uh, my understanding, are like upwards of like $80 million for, for a typical deal size. Um, obviously, a lot of development projects are um, much, much smaller in, in nature. Um, does Ever City have a way of, of kind of um, 
fragmenting larger loans into many different loans and, and, and being able to serve the, 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 the ability to kind of get you know, scale that that large monetary amount to to larger numbers of of um, projects that, that don't need so much but could definitely use the preferred interest rate you know uh sure that's a great question and that's one of the trends that uh we can cover next uh how we can use you know blockchain technology and also open source so that's uh that's really important and uh, the situation is that uh, most green finance vehicles like bonds and you know even loans they're right now used by really big guys uh, really big banks really big corporations and uh when these instruments are discussed at the climate conference there is a lot of skepticism from developing countries that hey guys you just invented something for yourself and now you're playing with it but we don't actually get any benefit or when we you know when we actually receive something the financial conditions are not favorable at all and uh, that's you know something that we cannot actually use so these were the you know the problems and these problems can really be solved, uh, you know, by blockchain. And uh, frict fractionalization is, uh, you know, one thing. Yeah. Uh, and also securitization. So when you actually combine like smaller loans, like 100 small loans, and then there is a bank who is issuing a green bond to refinance those smaller loans, you know, that's also... A very interesting use case is the use case that uh, many in the financial um, industry are are talking about and thinking about. So this is truly one of the opportunities to connect smaller scale projects and uh, huge banks. So if you want to do that, that's one of the directions that you might take. And uh, more importantly, you know these big banks, big investors. They want to invest, they want to deploy capital, but because of those uh, restrictions, they cannot actually deploy it and they cannot find enough uh, projects. So they desperately need the toolkit that will enable them to work with smaller projects, package them into bigger like investment vehicles, do everything in a proper green way. That's very important to work with institutionals. So you have to you know, adhere to those green finance standards, whatever they are. And also, it's important for them to accumulate data sources, right? So everyone is talking about we need the granular data. If we are investing or, you know, refinancing those packages uh, with hundred or thousand smaller loans and companies, we need to understand what happens in each of them, right? And get the data uh, almost online. Uh, in a in a really timely manner so that is very important and that's uh, one way of doing this but another way of doing this is uh through new types of uh mechanisms and new types of uh, uh investment vehicles so i'm a lot will come from the DeFi market actually and uh when we look at Klimadao, of course, they might uh, have done a lot of things wrong. And now they're kind of paying for it. <laughs> so that's, yeah, that's what they have to face. But uh, what they did, actually, their main innovation is that they breached uh, DeFi mechanisms and uh, green finance markets. And uh, this is, I think, is going to be a trend. Because all of these banks, all of these financial institutions, they're really slow. And uh, adoption really takes a lot of time. So it, it moves somehow, but it's still not there. And uh, when we talk with these banks and financial institutions, they always value two things, risk and innovation content. And usually the risk part actually kills most of the innovation content mm -hmm. because, you know, they want to do just smaller steps, small innovations that will lead to a bigger innovation. And this is not like a disruption, right? This, this, this not, uh, does not really solve the key problems. It can solve the problem, but we need to get there. But if you heard uh, just yesterday, a new IPCC report was released stating, you know, it's not new, you know, 
everyone in climate know that we're kind of doomed already. Right. <laughs> and, you know, we're not meeting the Paris Agreement target. So we need to, you know, uh, do whatever we can right now to increase climate financing. And that's mm-hmm. where actually open source and uh, Web3 can help. Because, um, you know, I think the most exciting trend will be what Dow did, but for other instruments as well and for other markets. Just combining DeFi mechanisms and uh, DeFi economy and finance with uh, labeled and high quality green finance. So if we will be able to uh, channel people's kind of greediness in a good way, I mean, right. you know, uh, like, uh, you know, high high risk profile of crypto investors and stuff like that. If we somehow can connect it with green finance, and I mean, not only carbon, you know, but also other credits. And if we make sure that those assets are really making the real, like real life impact with all the methodologies we have with DMRV, with other players, you know, verifying this sometimes on the ground and we still need that, then we're going to succeed. And uh, this has a tremendous opportunity for scaling because, uh, uh, you know, if it could be replicated by other people, users around the globe, if it can bring liquidity to the core, you know, protocols that could make this happen, this this would be like a major victory. And I think the trend that we will be seeing like uh, more and more refi stuff, uh, uh, you know, until the moment where actually DeFi becomes refi. (laughs) And uh, we actually need that, you know? And uh, if we look at refi as a new type of financial industry, then we can look, uh, if we want to predict the trends, we can look at traditional financial industry which is becoming greener and greener. And at some point we'll have to green their whole portfolios. And there are many right. banks, and asset managers who have committed to that. Right. So I think DeFi and blockchain will also, you know, at some point will realize that it's, it's important because we cannot live as our physical bodies on chain, right? right. <laughs> and we have to take care about what is going on around us, you know? Uh, so that's you know one of the forecasts and i think that's the most exciting and important thing but i want to warn you not to go too much into the DeFi, you know space because it can be considered a scam it can you know it can actually spoil the whole thing and uh that you you don't have to do and uh it's that's why you know all of the statements that i did it's important to know whom are you doing this for standing on the shoulders of giants, respecting what has been done, but doing some really cool innovation. And the most disruptful innovation, I think, will come from intersection of uh, the green part and the DeFi part and also, uh, you know, mechanisms and uh, uh, technologies that can be used and replicated in developing countries. And they're opening up right now to that. Uh, I think it's the most exciting times right now to innovate because... At COP in Egypt, uh, I talked to many African countries and uh, what they actually need, again, they want to start green finance in their countries, raise green finance, but they need technology. And open source is a good way to kind of, you know, enter those markets because, uh, again, many people think that if they use your proprietary tech, they will lose their independence and will there will be a vendor lock, which is in most cases... You know, right. In terms of open source, everyone can have win-win situation. And that goes very much in line with the core, uh, you know, sustainable development goal values. And the last thing I want to mention is that if you truly build stuff open source, then UN doors will be always open to you. And that's very important because it's where you can meet your, you know, fellow uh, builders, fellow, you know, users, uh, advocates, governments, uh, literally anyone. And uh, it's it's really good. So I encourage you to work more with UN agencies. But for that, big part of your work has to be open source and true open source. 
Would you so said, uh, uh, oh, go ahead, Kailash. Yeah, yeah. So, like, so regarding the, I mean, I seen your website about the global standards. So, uh, for the carbon credit, for example. So, are you following a specific like where our gold standard, or there is a separate global standard from United UNC? Uh, yes. Could you rephrase the question, please? I didn't catch yeah, the last. So, question. A question is regarding regarding the global standards. So you mentioned about the global standards in your website and you were you you talk to. So, which global standards are you following? Uh, global standards or UN yeah. bodies with whom we are partnering. I think that's which specific ones you're following. Yeah. That so it depends on the case. You know, uh, indeed, in ESG there are, in green finance, there are lots of standards. Okay. But if you know, if we have a closer look, we will see that there are leading standards. There is like a high quality cohort of standards. There is like a medium, you know, the most popular standards and stuff like that. So when we're talking about green debt, we're looking mainly at uh, International Capital Markets Association standards, ICMA, and they have a lot of uh, stuff for bonds, for loans and stuff like that. Uh, we also look at the climate bond standard, which is the most sophisticated green bond standard, and uh, they're pretty open to innovations as well. But when we look about, uh, when we look at, uh, you know, green screening and understanding the whether assets are green or not we'll look at the EU taxonomy standard and there will be more and more regional taxonomies which actually can tell you what is green and what is not and when we look at carbon um you know we also look at the common standards that are there and uh we're just trying to make things a little bit uh kind of better and and more efficient and the last, uh, you know, last product that we presented at COP uh, uh, were carbon forwards. And uh, in the carbon forwards, we looked at most of the standards and we tried to make this product standard agnostic, not to actually be uh, kind of tied up to one standard, but rather kind of uh, we looked at most of the standards and we tried to compare them and see what is similar in all of those standards to actually somehow help to standardize. So when I was uh, telling to this uh, refi newcomer guys to look at CDM, it's actually something that you know we we did, and we looked at most of the standards and we tried to understand what similar similarities do they have. So in our work, we do a lot of generalization, and this is what I think we need for open source stuff as well uh to be really uh, universal so we don't have to only look at one standard we have to look at the principles that those standards uh were using to build themselves and make credible and when we do that we will see that most of these standards they're universal so that's uh, i think key when creating open source stuff as well and that's what i mean when uh, i say that we need to stand on the shoulders of giants so respect those principles and build on on top of them make them sharper make them even you know more efficient uh that's yeah that's it, it this is what it is and regarding impact we also use a couple of impact indicators um and also of course sdgs because sdgs they're the main uh you know global framework for many things i think sdgs have a lot of potential I mean, sustainable development goals. And uh, you probably may know that they also have targets. So you might also look at targets as well and uh, for each goal. And uh, what makes SDGs so unique is that every country around the world have uh, has agreed on them, you know? And uh, SDGs, among with the Paris Agreement, those are two global frameworks that people around the world share. And they share them, you know, without exception. So this makes it a very universal, very useful framework to follow. But the difficulties start to come up when you look deeper into each target and indicators and, and stuff like that. Okay. One, one quick question. You mentioned uh, this idea of the, the need for securitization of, of smaller, um, yeah, impact projects, sustainability projects. Is there any, to your knowledge, is there anybody making um, 
headway in this particular space that, that we could look at? Is there any, are there any successful models out there or anything off the top of your head? I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot. Uh, so uh which exactly uh so you know so can, can you so yeah so for example uh if you're if you are looking at uh technology to um lower the methane emissions from a from a oil and gas field right and say you know that technology is you know cost a million dollars um you know so you you want to you know develop a, a way to kind of securitize uh, 90 oil fields to make it interesting to, um, you know, a blended finance, you know, uh, vehicle or, or, or as a single link, but loaner bond. Is there anybody that, or any solutions out there that you've seen that address that sort of issue? And I can, there's also like, you know, Paul, I know another, that's palm oil, um, uh, but what there's a, there are a lot of different smaller projects that could be grouped together and, and, and um, secured. Uh, and, and, and secured. Um, is there any organization or any technology that's making headway in that particular space? Yeah. So first of all, these kind of groupings they existed even in the carbon world without blockchain, and uh, even in CDM there were like, you know, aggregated projects and stuff. So again, right. you know, we can look at this. Um, but uh, if you want to look more at uh, innovations that come from the you know climate finance space, I advise you to look at the cases uh, in the climate finance lab. Uh, they are really innovative. They don't have specifically like a blockchain focus, actually. Uh, but uh, they are a really cool think tank where you can actually learn uh, a lot about this kind of innovations and what's going on. And uh, I can remember there were some uh, similar projects uh, to what you mentioned, actually. Okay, great. But, uh, you know, what I want to say is that uh, many banks really want to do that, but uh, they don't have uh, too, too many examples, successful examples. So I think it's a trend that will, um, you know, will be possible also because of digital technologies and not necessary blockchain. And uh, if you look at the climate finance, um you know use cases that they support you can find some really interesting things there great I okay uh, and you... of chat and um it's basically because a democratized digital bank would be one that makes investments where the invest where you know the, the people who are investing into that bank tell them to and so there wouldn't be any runaway fossil fuel investments, for example. Um, and so I put in the chat questions about you know, helping to find these banks so that we can invest in them, so that we can see if they're democratic and what are some of the problems that could happen like with digital banks, freaking funds. Yeah, so, um, um, yeah, so I guess there are there are some of these banks, but also there are old school banks, and we need to do something with them, right? Uh, so we always shared uh, the approach that we should actually work with these guys, but just like tell them what needs to be done, you know, highlighting the benefits. That what that's what I was doing during my whole life, you know. I was always telling them, you know, hey guys, um, you know. This is how we can do it. This is very exciting. This is very innovative. This is good for your marketing. It's good for impact. And depending on, on what they were interested in most, I was like highlighting this kind of thing. So I believe that uh, we need not only to work with green banks, but also we need to transform, uh, you know, the the, the, the the legacy banks into green banks. And they're doing actually a lot, but uh, we need to help them <laughs> somehow. And that's... Uh, why I think you know the what Hyperledger is doing is a super important uh, work, and uh, you know I, I support this approach very very much. But also we need to lead as an example, right? Because uh, when Klimadao and some other folks, you know, they did some remarkable things and achievements, then the legacy players they started to move, you know, and started to think, ah, oh, okay, we we can do it. You know, that's something that uh, is important um but going back to your question uh, so you want me to address this complaint from africa 
the digital banks can freeze your funds, right? That's the first question. Um, yeah. So what can I say? You know, we've seen that uh, banks are freezing funds and not only digital ones, right? Centralized banks uh, are freezing a lot of funds as well. And we know <laughs> a lot of recent cases, right? No need to tell you. I can just show you my cup. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is actually one of the benefits of uh, decentralization. And if we, uh, if we can truly make, you know, decentralized protocols for the value exchange, like Bitcoin, right? We will never, uh, Bitcoin can never freeze your funds, right? So that's pretty cool. And I guess uh, the answer would be, again, uh, open source, decentralization, building new types of financial you know, mechanisms that would be actually connected to the real world by the real impact that they're making. And that's, you know, goes back to the trend I highlighted, the something that we need to do. So I guess if, if you talk to these guys again, you can, you know, give them example of Silicon Valley Bank and then an example of Bitcoin that no one can really freeze your Bitcoin, you know, funds and stuff. Uh, so that's, that's, I think, a good argument, but, uh, in general, none of the banks, uh, can guarantee that they will not freeze your funds because there is another saying when you, you're sending your money to the bank, it's not your money anymore. It's the money owned by the bank and the bank is actually using this money, you know, as they want. So they can lose it and they can be subject to any kind of uh, issues by the government, any regulation and stuff. And it's there, there is no safe heavens now. That's the reason for my second question, because you should be able to just go ahead and click on, you know, open an app and click on, you know, I want to find a greener bank than the one that I'm invested in that just decided to go for fossil fuel investments. So um, I would like that app to say, okay, well, I found a green bank that will do the swap that you're trying to do. So I'm, I'm offering my bank a swap. I, you know, I'll take your bad, your bad notes on the housing. I'll take your housing uh, problems away. You give them the mortgage back to them. And then I'll give you my carbon credit. It's a three-way swap, a Byzantine swap. And I'm wondering, you know, if, how do I find a bank willing to do that? There's got to be an app out there for that, because this is a, a, the tool of democracy. You find that you find the, the government, you find the bank, you find whatever it is that you need, because that's going to listen to you and and do the swap that you need. But wh why do you even need a bank in this uh, system? Because um, who, because I have never found I have searched and never found anyone who has housing nearby willing to swap it for carbon credit directly. They want dollar bills. Okay. But you think that the bank will help you to find this kind of... It would be any bank that is interested in, in my carbon credit to decrease, that they would be able to decrease their carbon footprint. And in exchange, they would swap the housing, their, you know, the mortgage. They've got people who are, you know bailing on their mortgages and defaulting and they want to get rid of that bad paper mm -hmm. well that's interesting i know a couple of green banks in the u.s actually uh so i can maybe send well, to you this year I, if you click on the first link um there's they then scroll way down they've got a link to a list of green banks and uh it, it might be on there and there's also a link to um a another link to more green banks. So cool. the thing is, is that there's there's got to be an app that tells me which of these is open to the this Byzantine swap. Yeah, um, Elizabeth, I think we, we'd love to, we'd banks. love to hear. If you, if, you, if you do hear that, I think it'd be really interesting to hear about if you can find that. If anyone's doing that already, that would be my goal, finding somebody who's already done it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, again, building building on the shoulders, not reinventing the wheel. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's, yeah, that's very interesting. You know, on that on that point, I was listening to that. Um, you know, when it comes to carbon footprints, people love their gigantic homes. So in this case, would that swap require the home to be only so many square feet? 
Right, and so that they would have to avoid the carbon tax on the square footage of their home. And I would be looking for a, an empty lot so I could build a tiny home on their 200 square okay. feet. Yeah, I don't know if people on the phone if ever, when, when that subject is broached about um, carbon footprints, nobody wants to talk about the size of their home. <laughs> it seems to be a, a red flag. Nobody will discuss it. They'll, they'll buy an EV that's powered by renewables and they'll put up a 10,000 square foot home as if um, they have no carbon footprint. And I'm just curious, has anybody also seen that dichotomy where people will not discuss carbon footprints with these massive homes? Absolutely, and then they condemn the homeless who have a zero carbon footprint. <laughs> I mean, even some of the advocates that are, you know, uh, media types, I won't name any names, but that we know about who are advocates for carbon reduction have massive homes or they have two or three homes. And it just seems a, a, one of those areas that may never get addressed properly is the massive carbon footprint on these, these mansions. But people who are out there advocating, we, get, we have to uh, lower our carbon footprints, have these massive homes with two or, or two or three of them. I always find that interesting. There's never a discussion on that point. Um, this first well, time I've seen something around that, around that topic at all. That's a yeah, really I mean, integration into the uh, token emissions network that Sai Chen's been working on because they're already they already have square footage building uh, set up in there. Hmm. Interesting. That's open source. Well, great. Um, well, Alec, I want to be uh, cognizant of your time. You've you've been so generous with it, and this has been very engaging uh and definitely a, a kind of a diversion from what we normally see where it's just a presentation i've really enjoyed how you've kind of engaged with us and, and shown or shared really interesting history um and just all around um really interesting perspective um on on something that's very near and dear to us so i want to thank you uh for your time uh, and thank everybody else uh, who brought so many really great questions. This has been a really uh, fascinating uh, past hour. So thank you, everyone, uh, very much. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I hope that was, uh, you know, kind of maybe useful for you. I tried to make it really more engaging and entertaining and just uh, tell you everything I learned about open source and uh, how to build it uh, for climate and environmental use cases. So I hope this was useful. And if you want to deep dive in, in some more details, uh, you can always contact me and we can have like a in-depth session on everything that was mentioned. Would love to. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. I've got to do some, uh, some, some thinking and some unpacking. I'll probably watch this again, but I really enjoyed it and uh, I'll be in touch soon. Thanks a lot. Have a nice day. Thank you. Enjoy. Thank you. Uh, be here today. Thank you. Thanks for the great questions. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.